But in the interest of maximizing our time with, uh, in the session here today, I think we'll get going. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shannon Stundenbauer, and I'm the research director at the Parkland Institute. It's been about uh, five months that I've been in this position now, and it's been interesting, it's been challenging, and always a lot of fun, mostly because of people like you, the community here uh, associated with the Parkland Institute. I'm really excited to be at my first conference as the research director, and I'm hoping to chat with as many of you as possible over the next few days, so please come and introduce yourself to me. I have a fairly long list of announcements to make this morning, so we'll get right to it. And the first is, is, is a bit of a plea warning. Do not park in front of the building, in the car park immediately out there, unless you want to make a large donation to the university. Um, apparently, it's exorbitantly expensive. There is a more affordable car park on 116th, Windsor Car Park, um, sort of out that way. If you need more precise directions, speak to uh, someone affiliated with the conference and we'll hopefully point you in the right direction. We're serving fair trade coffee and tea throughout the day, as, as we always do. Um, we appreciate donations toward costs. We're selling ceramic mugs for $5. And otherwise, it's great if you can bring your own uh, reusable mug. If you don't have that, uh, you can purchase a disposable cup for $2. The coffee itself is free. Uh, if you have any questions about the conference in general, look for a volunteer name tag or a staff name tag. Uh, if, if someone does of these uh, two groups don't know the answer to their, your question, we'll find out for you. And we'd also like to remind you that Parkland relies on donations from, from all of you and the organizations that you work with. Uh, those, that's the funds we use to carry out all our research and all our programming. All donors are automatically Parkland members, and if you give a monthly contribution of at least $10, you're eligible to receive our, our publications on hard copy. Upon request, you're considered a sponsoring member, and that's one of, your, one of your privileges. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in supporting our work, to fill out the pledge form included in your package and drop it off at the Parkland table. And while you're at that table, please check out some of our most recent reports. Um, you'll, see, you'll see our work. For your donation, you'll receive a charitable receipt in the mail. We have at our Parkland table, we have hard uh, copies of our most recent studies for sale and also free executive summaries if you want a sample of those. We'd like to take a few moments to thank our sponsors again, and it's, it's a long list and we're thankful to all of them. We've received assistance from the Alberta Federation of Labor, Athabasca University, Bullfrog Power, Civic Service Union 52 Benevolent Society, the Canadian Union of Public Employees Alberta Division, Niche, the Network in Canadian History and Environment, the University of Alberta Faculty of Arts, the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment, and I also want to make special mention of a very important sponsor who unfortunately didn't get acknowledged yesterday. That's the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. Um, their donation has gone to support the videography today and also to um, support the processing that will be needed to get it up on the website, all the videography from this conference, really quickly. So you'll be able to access everything you see going on here as a resource within relatively short order. And we're really grateful to Health Sciences Association for that support. We'd also like to acknowledge and thank our media sponsors, Alberta Views Magazine, View Weekly, and CJSR Radio. Um, now just a, a word to the process. We're going to have about 45 minutes of, of presentation, then I'll return to facilitate about 30 minutes of question and answer. And now, uh, without any further ado, um, we'll introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Andrew Nikaforik. For more than two decades, Andrew Nikaforik has written about energy, economics, and the West for a wide variety of Canadian publications, including The Walrus, The Globe and Mail, Chatelaine, and The Georgia Strait. From education to environment to petroleum and health, if you follow Andrew Nikaforik, you take a tour of some of the key issues affecting Albertans and Canadians today. His work has been recognized with numerous awards, including four National Magazine Awards, the Atkinson Fellowship in Public Policy, an award that he tells me he's particularly proud of, which is the Rachel Carson Environmental Book Prize offered by the Society of Environmental Journalists. Most relevant to our focus at the conference today are Andrew Nikaforik's writings and books on oil, which include 2010's Tar Sands, Dirty Oil and the Future of a Continent, and also the just recently released The Energy of Slaves, 
Oil in the New Servitude, and I understand that these books will be available uh, in the break immediately following this session. In his work on oil, Nikephoric has argued strongly for the negative consequences of oil wealth on economics, politics, and the environment here in Alberta, and also more broadly. He'll talk to us today about the petrostate idea through the example of the United States. Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Shannon. And first and foremost, I want to thank the Parkland Institute for making it okay to actually talk about petro states and power and, and, and the reality that truly is Alberta. Um, <laughs> Ralph Waldo M. Emerson uh, said nearly a century ago that when you put a shackle around the neck of a slave, you are also putting one around your own neck. And when states become dependent on oil, they do the same thing to their political and economic culture and to their own people. Now, uh, I've been asked to kind of define what is a Petra state. I, I just want to assure you that I, this is not a presentation from the uh, Enbridge Chair of Corporate Sustainability. Um, <clears throat> so, as everything tends to be these days. I mean, every academic institution and place is branded with oil, with an oil logo, um, which is typical of a petro state. Um, so, <clears throat> oil. It is the dominant source of energy on the planet. 70% uh, of all transportation fuel is oil, and it plays a remarkable role in global politics. Um, let me just... And it is rac rac uh, 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 rapidly changing um, global economics. So what we have, we have a kind of a situation around the globe where we have a master class and a slave class. We have oil exporting nations and we have oil importing nations. And those nations that export oil, are, of course, are the nations we refer to as petrostates. And what's really kind of remarkable about this is that we are now seeing an extraordinary transfer of wealth from the oil importing nations to the oil exporting nations on order of three to five trillion dollars a year. That's approximately 10% of global GDP. No other resource on the planet is associated with that kind of extreme transfer of wealth. It is the most lucrative and the most volatile commodity on the planet. And it is reshaping politics everywhere. So my central points are for today, and this is what I want you to walk home and think about as an Albertan um, and as a consumer of, of hydrocarbons, which we all are, we, are, we weren't given much choice about the matter, and uh, is that oil turns every country into a plantation economy where all of the conversations, all of the, the education, all of the, the media, everything becomes captured by this resource, and it is as, as ugly, and in many cases as abusive as life on, on a sugar plantation in the 19th century Caribbean. So there are a number of characteristics about uh, Petro states. The first one is uh, um, uh, political um, extremism. All right. The second thing about uh, 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 states is that there's no taxation without representation. They have totally fractured the taxation regimes, and they have uh, dysfunctional taxation regimes. The next thing about the petrostate you need to know is, is that they lose all statecraft. They're dealing with too much money, and abundance uh, stupefies the government. You think you can solve every problem by throwing money at it. And uh, uh, 
that's another characteristic. And then you have uh, uh, notions and illusions of grandeur, right? This is here, you think you're sitting on top of a pile of hydrocarbons and that suddenly uh, the good Lord has given you more intelligence uh, than other people. And then the last thing is authoritarian rule. So what oil does over time is that if you begin as a nation uh, with a very authoritarian regime, oil over time will strengthen that regime. If you begin as a democratic society, oil over time will erode all of your institutions. That is the power of oil money. The last and final thing about oil uh, petrostates is that they will make you fat and lazy and apathetic. There is so much money, you stop thinking. You go to the Middle East and ask anyone in the Middle East what they think about oil, and they will tell you, oil has made us fat and lazy. All right, so let me begin with a quick story, which is really where, where, where we need to begin, about the U.S. experience, and then let's talk about some of these characteristics of the Petro state. So the United States really was the oil pioneer. Um, oil was, of course, not used as a, uh, as a fuel source in the beginning. It was used as a lubricant. And so uh, oil was uh, uh, d discovered and exploited in Pennsylvania, and then it would be refined into kerosene, and that would be a, a source of illumination throughout the United States. And oil really took off as a source of illumination because after the Civil War, the United States decided to, to tax camphor, which is a source of uh, uh, hydrocarbons from trees and pine plantations in the United States. They taxed that. That made kerosene the uh, illumination of choice, the poor man's choice, and the resource took off. The first oil fields, of course, were in Pennsylvania. They looked like this. This sparked the greatest economic boom in the United States since the California gold rush in the 1850s, 1860s, and finally in the 1870s. Um, everyone was going to Pennsylvania, to the oil regions of Pennsylvania, to make their fortune. Of course, the guy that made the biggest fortune of all was this fellow, John D. Rockefeller. He immediately got into the oil business, very clever man, an extraordinary businessman in many ways, and he wasn't interested in that messy drilling and all that sort of stuff. He said, you know what, I'm going to refine this stuff, and, uh, and, he, uh, and, and not only that, I'm going to control that whole refining industry, and so he created Standard Oil. And um, there was just an enormous source of conflict in Pennsylvania and the oil regions between ordinary producers and refineries and this company that really began to mark the whole nature uh, and character of, and, and, and change the character of, of uh, American capitalism. So Rockefeller recognized that oil was a force that reorganized business because of the enormous amount of wealth it created in a short period of time with a minimum amount of effort. And then he used that wealth to concentrate, to standardize, to destroy his competitors. And of course, the oil and gas industry is known to this day for its lack of transparency and its secrecy because all of Standard Oil's contracts were secret. And uh, that is a stamp that went on all of American business. And then, you know, eventually this company, which the Americans broke up in 1908, and then it kind of reassembled itself into ExxonMobil, and it is now today one of the world's most powerful corporations that makes every year half a trillion dollars in sales. It is Steve Cole, uh, a great reporter for The New Yorker, has described ExxonMobil in his most recent book, Private Empire, as a corporate state within the U.S. state, a no-compromise institution. This is the institution that funded uh, climate change denial for more than a decade. This is the institution that Stephen Harper's father worked for as an accountant back in the 1970s. Then along comes this guy, Henry Ford, in the car, and the car takes off, and Americans start spending their oil now to run machines. And they go on a great and, and, and an incredible joyride throughout uh, the United States, and uh, phenomenal growth in cars, and to such an extent that, you know, 70% uh, of the oil spent today in the United States is all going through a car or a machine or a plane. When the Americans are get hooked and they get addicted. And 
the oil industry, of course, takes off, and you go from one region to another. So the United States is in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. It is the Middle East of oil, and Texas is the Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and California becomes the Kuwait, and you throw in Oklahoma, and then Louisiana, and, uh, and, and off they go. And these were the world's central uh, producers of oil. They were the world's first petro states. So if you go back and you look at the history of Oklahoma and the history of Texas and the history of California and the history of Louisiana and you start adding it up and putting it all together, you find the same sort of profile of dysfunctionality that I'll be talking about um, uh, as I define more what the Petra state is. So you had all these boom towns and people would rush to them in their Model T Fords. That was the best way to get to East Texas for the booms. And this explosion of activity, uh, generation of extraordinary wealth. Uh, here's Huntington Beach in California. Uh, and, uh, and then, okay, of course, the Americans get concerned. All right, we're, we're spending our oil so quickly um, let's take this industry abroad. So Standard Oil goes to Venezuela. Standard Oil then, and, and Chevron, they go to the Middle East. They take this oil culture, this pioneering oil culture, and they colonize the world with it. And I always find it ironic. I mean, someone like Dick Cheney says, you know, oh, you know, why did God put oil in all those bad places. How could, you know, isn't it shameful that God would do something like that? You know, and then the political scientists and the economists say, what nonsense. Those places, they were all nice places before oil arrived, but oil's wealth and corruption undermined Venezuela, changed the Middle East, destroyed places like Nigeria, and on it goes. So God never put oil in a bad place, but oil quickly turned many places into, into uh, hells, uh, uh, separate hells for oil. So the United States begins to expand. You begin to see this oral culture all over the world, and we see the appearance of more and more petro states as the Americans spread this around. And then massive changes are taking place in the United States. Here's Buckminster Fuller, you know, the father of the geodesic dome. And, um, and what does he have to say? He, 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 he makes a startling observation in 1940. He says, the United States is an exceptional place. And why is it exceptional? Because it's got cheap energy, and it's feeding this cheap energy to an extraordinary number of energy slaves in the form of machines. And he goes, look, back in 1810, you had one million Americans, and on average, they had one slave. But thanks to oil and machines, now every American had at their fingertips 39 energy slaves per person. And not only that, the concentration of this power in the United States made it number one. 53% of the world's energy slaves were now located in the United States. The addiction goes on, and um, after World War II, the Americans, with oil money, create the Marshall Plan. What is the Marshall Plan all about? Well, Europe at that point is still hooked on coal. Who controls coal in Europe? Communist unions. So the Americans subsidize the Marshall Plan in order to get Europe off coal onto oil. What oil do they have to buy according to the Marshall Plan? They have to buy oil from the Middle East developed by American companies in places like Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and then the Americans just kind of go nuts with their oil. They create this massive trillion dollar infrastructure that they are now having trouble to maintain, and, uh, uh, and, and, and gridlock and congestion and, uh, and the, the great religion of acceleration. And here you can just begin to see the, the dependence of the American economy and infrastructure and political culture on pipeline infrastructure alone in the United States. And so with oil and these energy slaves and the machines and the cultures of petro states of places like Texas, by the way, Texas sent four presidents to Washington, D.C. Eisenhower, LBJ, and two Bushes. And, uh, <clears throat> but the Americans construct a different civilization. It's all about mobility, all about migration, all about movement, and it's all about cheap oil. And it's all about, you know, get going. And then Admiral Rickover, who's a fascinating fellow in American history, the father of the nuclear submarine, and as a consequence, he knows a lot about energy, unlike the average American. And 
He said, look, fossil energy feeds machines, making us master of an army of mechanical slaves. The humblest American enjoys the services of more slaves than were once owned by the richest nobles. But he said, what's going to happen when this resource becomes expensive? How will the American experience deal with that moment and that change? That time has come. American oil production peaked in the 1970s, and now the United States is dependent on these petrostates around the world. Despite the fact that, that there's the, you know, a, a, a recent renaissance in local production, it's not going to change the fact that the United States has now been spending, on average, just in the last three years alone, $800 billion importing oil so that people can run their large SUVs around the United States. And to protect this whole infrastructure and this whole culture, between 1976 and 2007, the United States spent $7 trillion on warships and fleets in the Persian Gulf to protect any disruption in supply of oil from these petrostates. All right. Then along comes this girl. This is Terry Lynn Carl. And Terry Lynn Carl, I think, is probably one of the most provocative, innovative political scientists in North America. She works at Stanford University. Not too many people know about her, but uh, she is an extraordinary visionary. And so she started, she sat down and she started studying petrostates in the 1970s. She started in Venezuela, and the Venezuelans said, look, um, uh, don't study OPEC, study the petrostate. Study what oil does to countries. And oil does to countries exactly what it does to individuals. It provides enormous comforts, it turns off our thinking about energy, and it makes us dependent on more and more um, uh, on, on materialism, individualism, and high levels of, of consumption. So that's what Terry Lynn Carl did. She went around the world, she started, <clears throat> excuse me, started studying petrostates, and, uh, uh, and, but one of the first things she did is she came back to Canadian. And she said, you know, petrostates are reliant on one staple, on one good. And who was the guy that came up with that idea about how one good, one resource, a fir, a white pine, a cod, could dramatically realign a political culture? It was Harold Innes, one of Canada's greatest economic historians. And Harold Innes, you know, came up with the staple theory sort of as a defense against the violent fluctuations which are characteristic of exploitation without afterthought of one staple. And that's been the Canadian experience for 400 years. We started with furs, now we're on to bitumen. So what is a petrostate? Well, first and foremost, Terry, Carl, Terry Lynn Carl said, well, a petrostate is a state that has 20% um, of its general revenue stream is coming from hydrocarbons. Once you kind of pass that 20% factor, you're hooked. You're gone. You are in full petro mode. And um, so, take a look at a place like Louisiana. 30 to 40 percent of its income is coming from oil. Go to Alaska. 90 percent of that state's revenue is coming from oil. Go to Nigeria. 77 percent of its income is coming from oil. Go to Alberta. 18 to 30 percent of our revenue over the last couple of years is all coming from hydrocarbons. So then you have governments that become dependent on the most volatile um, and but lucrative resource on the planet. And then what happens? Okay, so your, your government revenue stream is all hooked on this stuff. And then you have these incredible uh, volatility. So the really dark line up there, that represents um, uh, revenue in Alberta that's going up and down like a yo-yo, all right? We get fat, then we get thin, we get fat, we get thin, you know, schools are flush with cash and then schools are crunched, you know? <laughs> we're building highways and then we're not building highways. Um, we, we've got this incredible schizophrenic profile where, you know, we're either gorging ourselves or we become bulimic and, and going on these, these incredible political diets. And, all the other places in there, Saskatchewan, BC, and Ontario, you don't see that kinds of volatility because they're not hooked on the resource. So, 
What do petrostates do? They rely on an unsustainable development trajectory fueled by an exhaustible resource, and the very returns produced by this resource form an unblockable, an implacable barrier to change. Now, when I read that sentence about six or seven years ago, when I was trying to figure out the province that I dearly love, Alberta, I sort of sat down and I had this enormous sense of relief in the sense that I, I now understand what this province is about and why it is so wacky and dysfunctional and weird when it comes to its political culture. This explains it. Yeah. So, let's look at some of the, the things that petrostates do, one by one. The first thing they do is they lower taxes. They want everyone to make you feel warm and fuzzy about the production of this resource in, uh, and, and the way to do that is that we're, we're going to lower your taxes. And then you catch um, the Dutch disease. All right? And uh, just a few words on that because there'll be much discussion about that later today. And then the second thing with all the money, you think that, God, this money is uh, great and it has conferred me with superior intelligence, so you abandon all notions of statecraft. All right? Um, and the next thing is you start to concentrate power because with the money, it wouldn't be great just to stay in power a little bit longer than everyone else, and that's what petrostates do. And then quite often, many petrostates will fund all forms of political extremism. So um, oh, here's just an illustration of, 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 of you know, in Alberta, uh, Taxes. So the first issue has to do with taxes. If you're, and, and my point here is if you're not being taxed, you're not being represented. And if your government is then running on hydrocarbon revenues, it's going to represent the hydrocarbons. And here's a good classic example. Other uh, uh, provinces where, you know, they actually have sales tax and normal things like that. And Alberta, no. In Alberta, you don't have to worry about shit like that, right? because we're running on hydrocarbons. Um, but we also don't have to worry about representation then either, do we? Um, and so then we have people in the oil patch and in the Alberta government who are saying, can say this, right? You guys aren't paying for your hospitals. You're not paying for your roads. You're not paying for your services. It's big oil. And I'm doing you a favor. And you guys should be very grateful, and in fact, you should bow down in a state of servitude to the industry because we're providing you all these wonderful services. So, total break of the bond of taxation and representation. Parkland Institute has said a lot about this, but I, I, I want to show you that other people are thinking this. So I picked up, this is a Deloitte study, excuse me, it came out in 2012, not 20, 2021. Um, <laughs> I'm, I don't have that much foresight, but uh, and, and, so and, and a remarkable document. I just found it the other day. So here's what they're saying about this. Well, it, what happens? Weakens the fiscal social contract between citizens and state leaders as the normally taxpaying public exerts less scrutiny of how tax revenues are raised and spent. By God, there's another great definition of life in Alberta, right? And so when you have this no representation, what does the population start doing? They stop voting. Why should we vote? We're not being represented. We know who runs this place. And what does Terry Lynn Carl have to say? When taxation is absent, populations tend to be politically inactive, relatively obedient, and surprisingly loyal. Extraordinary, eh? And then if somebody comes along and starts to raise some questions about electoral fraud, as Lauren Gibson did in 2008, he's fired. We don't want to hear about that in a petro state. I'm not going to say too much about the Dutch disease, but every petro state experiences from Venezuela to Nigeria to Russia. I mean, you can find on the internet all kinds of studies and reports on the Dutch disease in Russia, the Dutch disease in, in Venezuela, the Dutch disease uh, here and there and all over the place, but not in Canada. We can't have a debate about this. It's, we're in a state of denial. We said, oh, no, it doesn't exist. So what is it? Massive increases in the production of one product, bitumen. Temporary appreciation of the exchange rate, our dollar goes up. Exports become more expensive to the rest of the world. And the exporters of non-oil products produce less. And here we go, here's an illustration. 
The big black line, that's petroleum. The crashing line, that's automobiles. And then, but the people asking the most questions about the Dutch disease are not surprisingly people who live in the manufacturing heart of this country. Here's another thing that, that every petro state's got wrapped up in, and this is the, the kind of illusions and hallucinations they start to experience um, sitting on oil. So here's a Norwegian that went around the world, and he wrote a rather fabulous book about this very phenomenon, and he says, oil makes people believe that the desert can turn green, that socialism can be reborn, that wealth can be generated without work, and that there are no limits to where one can go. And so you, you look around and you say, you know, the Shah of Iran was going to create the great civilization. Somehow he didn't quite make it. Uh, Canada was, is, it, you know, it, it is announced in London, England, no less, by our prime minister, he didn't have the guts to do it here, that we are somehow going to become an energy superpower. You know, when in fact we're really just an energy supermarket. Everything is up for sale. Come on in, guys. You guys from China, come on in and take, you know. Um, <laughs> You go to Dubai, and they've spent half a billion dollars uh, building a ski resort so that in a country where the normal temperature is 40 degrees, you can go skiing. What? Who the hell does that? A petro state does that. All right, Saudi Arabia, you live in a desert? We're going to grow our own grain. Water is no limit. What we'll do? We'll spend our oil to desalinate the water so that we can grow this stuff. Extraordinary. And not only in the process, but we'll get hooked on Western diets and become big and fat like North Americans at the same time. And then you go to Kyrgyzstan and other places, and they build these capitals surrounded by slums. Right? But the, the marble has come from Italy. And isn't that uh, Oslo? Even the Norwegians are, are not immune to this kind of uh, fantasy life that Petro States spent nearly a billion dollars on an opera house. I had no idea Norwegians were that great fans of, of, of opera. Um, there you go. And of course, what do we do in Alberta? You know, what did Ralph Klein call this? Well, it's, we're digging holes in the ground, but it's the eighth wonder of the world. Right? That's what Ralph Klein said. In a moment of sobriety, no doubt. Um, <clears throat> now, here's the other really uh, extraordinary thing about Petro States. All right? So you've got this unhealthy revenue stream that you've really done nothing to deserve. Just, it's sim simply the, um, the product of geological good fortune. And uh, how do you use the money? Well, you use the money to manipulate the critical process to extend your shelf life way beyond your expiration date. All right? So Texas. Texas was ruled by the Democratic Party for 90 friggin' years. And now the Republicans are on a roll. They've been there for 30 years. That's not normal. You know? And Texas, of course, is a petro state. Mexico, on the basis of its state-owned oil wealth, and by the way, oil still accounts for 30% of the state's revenue in Mexico. The PRI ruled Mexico for 70 years. Alberta? We're going on 42 years here, ruled by one party. And we think that's normal. Well, it is normal in a petro state. It's not normal in a democratic state. High levels of dependence on oil rents have always tended to reinforce the regime in power. And when does that ever change? It only changes, as the Arab Spring demonstrated, when the price of oil falls. The only window for political change in a petro state comes crashing, occurs only when oil falls, the price of oil falls, and everyone can see for a brief instant that the hallucination, the fantasy, was just that. And that's what they saw in North Africa and the Middle East in 2008 when the price of oil crashed from 140 to 30 bucks a barrel. It was an opportunity seized 
throughout the Middle East. And look how most of it was actively repressed. What does Terry Lynn Carl say? Periods of low oil prices offer the best opportunity for change. High prices close the window of reform. You want to change the government in this province? You have to understand that basic fact. Political extremism. All right, well, we're all familiar with, uh, with this guy. Um, by the way, he ruled Libya for 42 years. Um, we're quite familiar with the uh, Alaskan populist, uh, the every charming Sarah Palin, um, who don't laugh, actually increased royalties in her state. She did something that Ed Stelmack didn't have the courage to do, but as soon as she left, and she did so with the cooperation of the Democrats in the state, um, as soon as she left, the oil lobby came back in and reduced all of the royalties once again. Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, everyone thinks, okay, well, Margaret Thatcher was that, you know, that the gal, that iron lady who ran England. How did she run England? She ran England on the proceeds of oil from the North Sea. You are looking at a classic petro politician who used that money to fund her own extreme political revolution and not one penny was saved. All right, I always laugh when people refer to these people as conservatives. You know, there was no conservation going on in England during Thatcher's uh, era. All right, they spent like hell. And now England is in big trouble. Nothing has been saved for the future. That whole pile of hydrocarbons was squandered. And not only that, we throw in a good little war with Argentina to boot, right? You got the money to do it, why not? So, Vladimir Putin. Here's, a, here's another great uh, petro politician. Nationalized oil wealth in Russia, that is what he has cemented his control of, of, of Russia on the basis of its extraordinary revenue stream from hydrocarbons. You know, here's some more uh, examples of, I, I like how they're holding hands that really, you know, it, it, uh, um, I mean, honest, I mean, this is extraordinary. Um, and yet we sort of think, oh, it's natural. They're, you know, two Petro guys, you know, just sharing the love. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, where do we see political extremism? We see it in Saudi Arabia. Well, all of those Americans filling up their SUVs have been funding an 18th century religious sect in Saudi Arabia, which is encouraging uh, groups throughout the Middle East to blow sh stuff up. And, uh, and Americans seem somewhat confused by the fact that their behaviors at home is supporting an extreme petro culture and state abroad. Um, it's like, you know, uh, having a bunch of slaves in your household without acknowledging the fact, yeah, that was a pretty rough voyage they had coming over here across the North Atlantic. Um, now, this political extremism is also very much part of American culture. This is Lyman Stewart. He is the founder of the Union Oil Company in California. And uh, he, uh, you know, and I don't know if you remember this, I certainly do as a child. I grew up in California. So, you know, and, and he, we used, they used to have you know, Minutemen. That's what they called these guys. Minutemen would come to your car. Well, I mean, here, talk about the corruption of language, right? Revolutionary language. Minutemen, who were the great defenders of, of the American Revolution, they now become the guys that fill up your car and wash your windshield, and they do it all in a minute, of course. And, uh, but anyway, Lyman Stewart started this company, and what did he use his oil wealth for? He used it to revise an 18th century religious fundamentalist sect, um, and he produced a, a series of pamphlets called The Fundamentals, which he um, published on, with his own money along with his brother. And in these pamphlets, the enemies of Christianity included Roman Catholics, modern philosophers, atheists, Darwinists, socialists, and on the list goes. But here you see oil money being used to fund religious extremism in the United States around world, the time of World War I. The tradition goes on. 
in, in terms of political extremism, we have Huey Long in Louisiana who wanted to do to Louisiana what Standard Oil had done to Louisiana, which was basically rob it in many ways, but at the same time he wanted to redistribute some of the wealth while at the same time filling his own pockets quite liberally. And, um, and then we have these fellows in Texas, uh, the big rich. And the big rich arrive in the 1940s, 1950s on the basis of the East Texas, uh, East Texas oil fields, and they're flush with cash, they ride ostriches, they date Hollywood starlets. They're not all that you know, uh, kind of unusual than some of the wealthy people in the Middle East, and they fund political extremism. And uh, this guy, the senator from Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy, who was on the communist witch hunt, was almost entirely funded by the big rich in Texas. And the big rich also funded campaigns throughout the United States, in Maine and Maryland. They would pick their own candidates and they would fund them. Joe McCarthy went to Texas so often he became known as the third senator from Texas. And these guys, they started to fund religious programs, they started to fund uh, uh, some, uh, uh, William F. Buckley began his career on the basis of oil money funding his, his magazine. Joseph Howard Pugh, the guy that started the tar sands in the 1960s, was of the same ilk, and he spent his money on the John Birch Society and funding any number of US American right-wing think tanks. And he was the guy, you know, he was a heavy oil guy, but he thought, no, day would come when bitumen is going to be important. And then you look at Canadian American politics in general, and you, look, you know, here's Karl Rubb's sort of uh, division of the red states and the blue states, and then you take that map and you substitute it with a map of where the hydrocarbons are in the United States, and you begin to have a sense, I'll just put that back again and take a look at that again. The one exception there is being California. But the red states, they're the petro states, they're the oil exporting states. The blue states, they're the slave states, they're the, they're the ones that are in a state of servitude to the red states. Totally different political cultures as a consequence. You had the Koch brothers funding a political movement. These guys all made their money on oil. And in fact, and they fund their own political movement, the Tea Party. Right? Amazing. And Throughout the United States, you find this idea that somehow taxation is no longer connected to representation, another product of living in oil culture. So here's Daniel Altman saying, in recent decades, Americans have encountered far more inequality and far less social mobility than their parents, but narcissism leads these same Americans to reject restributive tax systems. What was Romney all about? No taxes, right? What is Harper all about? No taxes. Since they're sure they will succeed and have little empathy for those who don't. They prefer to receive tax breaks rather than investing in opportunities for future generations. As you know, Ronald Wright would say, this is another classic progress trap and also another example of ideological pathology. And then you have part of the, the uh, fundamentalist Christian movement in the United States has identified uh, Greens uh, as, as a demonic force in the life of the nation. They publish things called Resisting the Green Dragon. And uh, one of the greatest threats to society in the church today is the multifaceted environmentalist movement because they are challenging our consumption of fossil fuels, which, according to these guys, is a God-given right. And now we have the appearance of the same sort of petro-extremism in Canada. All right. So Stephen Harper comes from Alberta. He's actually born in Ontario. All right? He's an Ontario boy. He's not an Alberta boy. But he did go on the rigs. His father worked for Imperial Oil in the 1970s. That's the oil culture he grew up in. He also grew up in the petro state of Alberta, which is a you know, highly dysfunctional place. And he takes that dysfunction and its disregard for process and law to Ottawa. And so we have an omnibus bill that guts, as Ronald Wright talked about last night, almost all of our environmental legislation, and why? To ease pipeline construction and bitumen development and other mining development throughout the country. Extraordinary. 
the muzzling of scientists. If you're a scientist and a federal scientist in this country and you're talking about climate change or some uncomfortable or inconvenient facts, such as the contamination of the Athabasca River, forget it. You will be muzzled. You will be monitored. And here's nature saying, it is time for the Canadian government to set its scientists free. Whoever thought that one of the world's foremost science publications would be criticizing the repression of independent scientific thought in this country. We know we've got a problem with climate change and with greenhouse gases. The tar sands, 70% of our emissions. They will soon be 18 to 20%. And what does the Auditor General have to say about this? We're not going to meet any of our goals. We're not going to meet any of our targets. We're going to be just like Saudi Arabia and really not care about greenhouse gas emissions because first and more foremost, we want the money. And now we're trying to make deals with the Chinese, right? The Americans, our oil consumption is going down. The American oil production is going up. Americans are beginning to express some concerns about climate change, albeit reluctantly, uh, as has happens in many petro states. And so then we panic, we go into desperation mode, we gut our legislation, we muzzle our scientists, and we start negotiating with the world's most repressive government, the People's Republic of China, and we are telling its state-owned corporations, among the most corrupt and, um, and abusive in the world, to come and develop our resources. And not only that, we'll sign an investment treaty with them with no public debate. And these are the guys that we want to develop our resources. Typical behavior of a dysfunctional, chronic, uh, chronically dysfunctional petrostate. Now the last thing, got to talk a bit about the money, because petrostates are about money. And uh, Norway, unlike Canada, unlike Alberta, uh, has had uh, a healthy discussion about the money, and they said, okay, we're going to take it off the table, and we're going to put 90% of it in a pension fund, and this fund will grow year after year, and we got the idea from Peter Lougheed and the Heritage Fund. And so the Norwegians have now saved $650 billion for the day their oil runs out and that has all been saved for uh, future generations. And one of the, the critical things that changed Norway's approach to oil and why it is always cited as an exception when we talk about petrostates is this guy, Farouk al Qasim, an engineer from Iraq, married a Norwegian, their child had cerebral palsy, they moved back to Norway just as Norway, a fishing country, uh, <laughs> discovered oil in the North Sea and thought, what the hell are we going to do with this? We don't know anything about this commodity. And Farouk al Qasim, with his experience from Iraq, said, wait a moment, guys. Let me tell you something about this product and how it can corrupt and undermine you. And so he had two pieces of advice. He was hired within four days of arriving in the country. Uh, and he constructed the Norway regime. And he said, go slow save the money. Those were his two words of advice that the Norwegians largely followed. Of course, Lockheed actually wanted us to go the same way, but we have not saved. Our heritage fund is a joke. Um, we give away our resources still in this province. I mean, here's Murray Smith making a speech to Americans. The model that has worked so well for us is that the royalty structure for oil sands is we give it away at a 1% and share in the risk of these great ventures and great investments. How kind of Murray Smith to give it away. What businessman gives stuff away? Um, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said, well, in Norway, you know, the companies receive 22% of their net revenues from oil. That's pretty good, and they're happy to be there. But you know what? Alberta is giving away. They're giving away 53%. And again, the Parkland Institute has confirmed and documented this extraordinary multi-billion giveaway. And so Lougheed's target was 35% that we should keep for future generations. Klein's targets went down and down as his drinking became worse and worse. And Alberta's share is, you know, we, we are not even collecting what the Auditor General recommends that we collect. Complete negligence. And when the Auditor General points this out, what happens? Then we write reports like this about the Auditor General. To criticize government decisions and even promote alternative policies is contrary to the principles of Alberta's democracy. <laughs> 
There's a classic line. It reminds you exactly where you live, right? And what kind of policy does Canada have about its oil wealth? Zero. And who's supposed to make the majority of the money over the next 25 years? It's something like $500 billion that governments will earn from the exploitation of hydrocarbons in this country. The majority, $385 billion, will go to Ottawa. There is no conversation there about saving a dime of this money. All of the conversation is about we will crush the opposition, we will lower taxes, and we will compromise and buy each and every Canadians, and we'll make them fat and lazy and destroy the, the democratic process of this country. All right, so where do we go? And as I always, St. Francis keeps me going. So you start by doing what's necessary and to do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the possible. Now, first, before I get into some of the solutions here, I want you, each and every one of you, to repeat after me for one, one sec, brief second. I live, I live in a petro state. Now, doesn't that feel better that you've admitted that? Okay. Now that you've admitted it, we can do something about it. First and foremost, we all need, of course, to go on an individual diet. All of this starts at an individual level in some way or another, but we need help. We need all kinds of assistance. And nobody's gonna go on an energy diet unless we take the money off the table. The first and most critical and important reform to happen in this province is to take that 30% of revenue from hydrocarbons that's running our government so that oil companies can say they're uh, building our schools and our highways and our culture off the table. Until we do that, we will not be represented. We need to behave like owners. We are not behaving like owners. We're giving stuff away. You know, what did Lougheed say back in 2004? Behave like an owner. Save for a rainy day. Collect your fair share. Go slow. Add value. Not one party has come up and endorsed that as, as a program for Albertans. Yet the majority of Albertans, when they are polled, would have said, Amen. Let's do it. We have had no debate in this country about the, the, the pace and scale of of tar sands development. We desperately need that. I encourage everyone here to, to raise that issue. We need a national carbon tax. We have to admit that this resource comes with extraordinary liabilities, political, economic, not just for us, because these emissions don't stay in Alberta. They're all over the world. And we must show some moral leadership here. And we have not as a country. So my last word, I think, belongs to this fellow, uh, um, Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Um, and, and in honor of Ronald Wright's talk last night about civilizations and their progress traps and their ideological pathologies, Taleb has a word of advice for us. We become civilized only by knowing what to refrain from doing. Thank you. Well, thank you to Andrew Nickafork for that excellent and engaging talk. We've got about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. We'll take, like we did last night, we'll take three at a time. Um, and then we'll allow uh, Mr. Nikofork to deal with them in turn. Me first? Okay. Um, Andrew, um, through Jeffrey Simpson most recently, but others I've been reading uh, as well recently, we hear that in fact we've been wrong about peak oil that in fact by 2030 the United States is supposed to become self-sufficient in energy and so all this, these 
uh, hallucinations of being an energy superpower are profoundly misleading, if not, I'm actually, uh, I mean, we've just got everything all wrong, actually. Could you comment about where that's coming from? Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, the issue of carbon tax. There's no question that we're underpaying for the use of fuels. Uh, the, the cost to society in the world is much higher than we're truly paying for. Um, but I've noticed that the issue of carbon taxes are really, really hard sell politically. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how what they could be brought to fruition. It seems to be a big fail politically. Yeah, hi, Lou. Uh, you said uh, that with, you know the, the time to buck the pet when uh, when oil prices drop, but uh, that uh, almost ushered in the wild rose party here in Alberta, which uh, would have been even more beholden to uh, big oil and big ass. Uh, how can we perhaps prepare here in Alberta for the next decline uh, in oil prices? Okay. Three good questions. So, uh, Myrna asked, first of all, okay, what about the International Energy Association and its report saying that the United States could be exporting oil uh, by 2017 and actually even surpass oil production in Saudi Arabia? The International Energy Association has been wrong for about nearly 30 years. Um, this is a good example of, 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 of experts um, um, really um, putting forth uh, a profound amount of misinformation. Um, we really don't know how shale oil will pan out in the United States. It certainly is true that production is up. It is certainly uh, also true that it, it is wildly expensive, energy intensive, and environmentally destructive. Um, and it, it is, you know, just as uh, a, a much a signature of peak oil, uh, and peak oil doesn't mean we're running out of the stuff. Peak oil means we won't be able to afford to use the stuff, that we will go bankrupt if we uh, go on this kind of, of, uh, of extraordinary hydrocarbon diet, extreme hydrocarbon diet. So the, the notion that the United States is somehow going to take care of all of its own uh, energy um, needs is, um, is not true. Uh, the, uh, I have no doubt that, that the demand for bitumen is going to go down over the next five years. Um, and, and, but then that's what, you know, when you have a federal government and a provincial government that have no capacity to co plan, no interest to even conduct uh, uh, fiscal uh, risk studies about associated with rapid development and rapid growth, then you're going to get caught off. And then you begin to see this really desperate attempt by the government to say, oh my God, the Americans aren't going to want as much as we are capable of producing. We've got to find another buyer, and let's give away the farm in the process to these state-owned companies in China, when in fact, really, we should be happy at producing two million barrels a day, and then we should get our house in order. Um, okay, now, carbon taxes and politics. Uh, so why is the carbon tax so unpopular? And why has it been uh, attacked so vehemently by the state and, and by um, um, the conservatives? Well, if you put a carbon tax on hydrocarbons, you're really putting, and, and, and those hydrocarbons account for 30% of your re revenue stream, then you're going to fight that like hell. And, um, and, and so that's one of the reasons. I think another reason is that Canadian politicians have done a very poor job of talking about this tax, the fact that it can be e income neutral, and, okay, and then what exactly are you going to do with the money? All right? What kind of accountability will there be? What kind of auditing process will be associated with the spending of this money for uh, a transition, in, in uh, uh, energy transition in this country? Um, so we haven't had visionary leadership here, and a carbon tax is a real demonstrable threat to fat governments that don't want to put their house on order and don't want to represent you and tax you. They want to represent hydrocarbons. 
And I think the other thing, too, is there is an ideological aspect to this. Uh, Stephen Harper and most of the members of his party do not believe in climate change. They are climate change deniers. They will burn up this planet before they change. Um, Now, the next question, I've, I can't read my notes here. <laughs> Can you repeat that, please, quickly? Oh. Right. Okay. All right, so the question is about, okay, political change in Alberta and how do we prepare for it? Uh, well, isn't it extraordinary that when the oil prices dropped in 2008, we saw the appearance of two new political parties in this province, All right, because the window was open, and so one was the Alberta Party, and one was the Wild Rose. And, um, and um, you know, and the Wild Rose actually came very close to, to pulling off uh, a, a, a surprise upset. Um, but the injection of an enormous amount of money from one billionaire, billionaire here in Calgary rescued the one-party state. And, uh, but, all right, so how do we prepare for the future? Every political party in this country, in this province, that is interested in democratic reform, fiscal accountability, needs to put its platform together and needs to work together to take out the one-party state come the next election. Um, and there should be a five-point program and that program, you know, should be well defined before the next oil price shock. And I think that is the best way to, to go about it. And at the same time, Albertans need to be educated once again about what it means to be a citizen. A citizen is not afraid to be taxed because if you are taxed, you will be represented. But we have this notion that being a citizen here is all about making a killing and not making a living. No commitment to place. I will come here, I will rape this place, and then I will build my $2 million home on Vancouver Island. You know, shame indeed. Okay, we've got time for another round of questions, and I'll just ask everybody this time to be especially concise. Let's go down here. I want to tell everybody in this room, if you have not yet bought one or two copies of this new red book, you are missing a golden opportunity to become a, a really mad activist. I just I, want to assure you that Annika is not my publisher. <laughs> okay, I just said, but... Uh, but <clears throat> I just, I just want, I wanted to say that I, I came here full of expectations, but you have blown me away again and again. It's a miracle that I'm still here. <laughs> now, now to come to the point, you, I, I really liked your PowerPoint uh, presentation because I read the book, it's underlined, I thought about the book with my husband, we don't know who's going to read it first, but what I wanted to say is you had such a good chapter on those terrible economic experts who give us misinformation, and the other part of my question is, because it's, it's still part of your book, the other one is where you talk about the solutions are so challenging, and you talk about solar energy, wind, power, and geothermal, and you are very critical. I think you, you just kind of gave me new insights. I, I think this, this is like a breakthrough in thinking. And on top of, of those good three uh, things that you say, i like everybody to remember that slavery, we all have studied, we have known it. When you wrote these first two chapters of slavery, I knew this is the biggest breakthrough in analyzing oil. Thank you so much, and give me some hope. Okay, we'll do one right here, and then we'll end off right there. Uh, my question is, what about the cost in water resources? I think we really need to put some emphasis on that because our indigenous peoples realize they're fighting this tooth and nail. They realize you can't drink the oil and every single method of extracting 
the coal bed methane, the uh, bitumen from the oil sands, is polluting our water. Have you ever been threatened? Uh, I'm sorry, could... Have you ever been threatened? Okay. <laughs> okay, so... I, I think the first question was, okay, what about economics? Is what, and I'll, I'll keep this very brief. Most of our economic thinking over the last 100 years is primarily a function and product of oil, spendage, oil spending, of cheap energy spending. And uh, so we have really become one of the first civilizations on the planet that thinks about economics and, and stuff and the use of stuff without thinking about the energy inputs. And this is now being challenged by the fact that we have now switched to extreme hydrocarbons that are enormously expensive. You know, it takes $8 billion to produce 1 million barrels of oil in the Middle East. It takes $45 billion to bring 1 million barrels of bitumen on stream in Alberta, plus another 40 to $80 billion to upgrade it into synthetic fuel. As our hydrocarbons become more expensive and it becomes more difficult to run our energy slaves, and there are billions of them around the planet, our economies will stagnate and shrink. And this is a phenomenon that we are already beginning to see in Europe, where energy can, and particularly oil consumption is going down. We are seeing this in the United States, where oil consumption is going down, where Americans are driving uh, fewer miles, owning fewer vehicles, and uh, abandoning 40 million McMansions that they can no longer afford to maintain. The solutions to all of our energy issues are remarkably difficult and challenging. And I, I, I'll, I'll, just to keep it short, I, I encourage you to, to, to uh, crack open the book. Um, the second question was, was about cost and, and water resources. They are phenomenal. And right now, we give industry a free ride. We don't even charge them for the water. So we are subsidizing, it's another industry subsidy, um, and we have not adequately mapped even our groundwater resources in this province. And I, I can only, uh, uh, you know, m most of you here probably live in Edmonton or you live in a city or live, live in Calgary, but if you are a rural Albertan and industry is now coming calling and 70% of all drilling now involves hydraulic fracking, and so what is that? Well, that's using millions of gallons of water, tons of sand, and chemicals, and, and many of them toxic can, uh, uh, chemicals, many of them carcinogens, and then pumping them underground for a mile or two into these formations. With the result that you know, every well you put in the ground ultimately becomes a pathway for methane to leak to the surface or into groundwater. Um, and we have an unfolding disaster across rural Alberta, uh, uh, given the scale and pace of, of fracking throughout the province. We have not paid enough attention to our water. We have not paid enough attention to our diminishing glaciers. We have not, you know, it, it, again, in a petro state, what do you value? You value hydrocarbons and you devalue everything else. All right. Have I ever been threatened? Um, no, I haven't been threatened. And even if I had been threatened, it would not change what I say. All right. Well, please join me again in, in thanking Mr. Nikofort for his, his presentation today.
My, yes. my understanding is Mr. Nikafork is going to be available in the lobby to, to sign books and, and have conversations. So if you didn't get a chance, there were a lot of questions and I couldn't get to everybody. You may have a chance to address them personally. I'd also like to say that we've got a short break. There's, there's coffee available before moving into breakout sessions, which are over that way. They're a little bit of a walk, so give yourself a few minutes. Thank you very much.